Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Aho here with KissAnalog.com. All right, so today we're going to continue with our buck converter series. Got my trusty board down here. <laughs> All right, guys, if you haven't seen the first couple videos, I think this is a third one in the series. Uh, you might want to watch those, okay? The first one, I, I kind of compared the linear regulator with the buck converter, okay? They both do the same thing. They drop the input voltage down to an output voltage and regulate it, right? But then, in the second one, I also kind of talked about how the buck converter might have been developed. So it is a switching regulator, right? So we have this switch, and we turn it on and off. And it bucks, when it's open, it bucks the input voltage, doesn't let it through. When it closes, let's say it's on half the time, off half the time, so the duty cycle is 50%. So if that's the case, and then if you have 10 volts on the input, you get 5 volts on the output, you get the average. There could be some losses into some of the parts and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you had no inductor here, just a straight line, you would have VN is say 10 volts, and then you let it discharge down to, you know, some voltage, like say one volt, and then turn it on again, and let it charge back up to 10 volts, and then the average would be say five volts or something close to that. But you'd have this huge ripple, unacceptable. So you put, well, unless you're running a, a light or something that you can't really tell. But, you know, so then you put, you could put a resistor there and it would slowly charge up the cap and then the cap would chart, discharge into the load. So the ripple's not quite as bad, but then you get this huge dissipation through the resistor. So that's not something you want to do. So you put an inductor there. It does the same thing. It blocks the voltage, charges up the capacitor slower, but the inductor is like the capacitor, it stores energy. It's a reactive component. It's not a dissipative component like a resistor, right? So yeah, it does have some DC resistance inside it, just like the capacitor has some ESR, some equivalent series resistance. But you know, the ideal function of them, they would just hold energy, right? And for the most part, you know, that's the way we look at them, that's the way they are. All right, so I'm starting this switch mode power supply series using the buck converter because it's a great converter as it's a little simpler than some of the other ones, but it provides all the important concepts that you know you can roll into the other converters and understand those better too. Now, with pretty much all converters, uh, the magnetic, the inductor in this case, is the heart of the power supply. That's the important part of it. That's the thing that everything else is centered around. But yeah, you design all the parts together, but that inductor is very important. All right, so in most cases, I would say the duty cycle control is how you regulate input from output, okay? Percentage of time on is the percentage of the input goes to the output. There's all kinds of different control chips. We're gonna talk about those later. And some of them do use things like, say, frequency, changing the frequency to keep it regulated. But most often it's duty cycle. So in this case, with duty cycle control, does frequency, changing frequency, regulate it? Not really. I mean, it shouldn't be changing in a, in a situation like this. But then again, look at these. If you design this circuit to run at say 100 kilohertz versus say 500 kilohertz. If it's 500 kilohertz, that's five times bigger. That means your X of L is gonna be five times bigger. But if you don't need five times bigger, then your inductor can drop by five times. So the inductance can be, instead of say, I don't know, 50 microhenries, maybe it's 10 microhenries, so five times less. Maybe that makes the part smaller. Maybe not in all cases it's going to shrink your part a lot, but that's the overall idea, is you go faster in uh, frequency, you don't need to store as much energy in your ductor, just like your capacitors, because as frequency goes up here, say five times, that gets five times smaller. Well, that's great because uh, for every cycle, the time that a cycle is there is shorter, so you don't need to transfer as much energy per cycle so you can have smaller parts that's the idea but even though the value of the parts can drop by say the equal percentage 
uh, value that the uh, frequency increases by, it doesn't mean that the physical size is going to drop that same uh, percentage. You know, if you increase it five times, it doesn't mean, you know, the frequency goes up five times. It doesn't mean your doctor or your capacitor is going to drop by five times the size. There's incremental sizes, and there's a certain amount of energy and other things that come into play. But if you could drop your inductor and capacitor by twice the size by going five times faster, that would probably be a good thing. So, okay, so that's important principles and concepts that I want to bring into this video is the difference between duty cycle and frequency, just how you size your parts. But the most important thing really is your duty cycle, okay? Now, part of that thing is, is if your inductor is sized so that it, when that switch is turned on and it's storing energy, it's charging up, and then when this switch is off, it discharges energy and that diode helps complete that path so it can keep on discharging. Well, if it discharges completely before the next cycle, then that's discontinuous. It's not continuously providing current. It ran out of juice. It's done. I call it running empty or running dry. So you run dry in that inductor, no more charge left. You're waiting for the next cycle. And with continuous operation, it's like pushing that car. If you can keep it rolling, it's a lot easier to keep it rolling than to start from scratch again, right? To start from a dead weight standing still. So the control loop to operate continuous, a little simpler than discontinuous. Now, I just want to bring up another point. It's just something to put in mind, but Something we'll talk about when we start talking about control chips. Kind of like how I said that um, some control chips might use frequency to regulate. Some control chips might operate on this thing what's called critical conduction mode. What if you're just between continuous and discontinuous? The inductor just discharged all the current and then right then another cycle happens. Charges back up and then just as it's finished another cycle happens again. So there's really no dead time. It just completely you know, exchanges all the energy and then another cycle happens. That's another mode of operation, control chip wise, and that's called critical conduction mode. It's, you know, wow, it's critically running out and then we charged it again. So a lot of different control chips, those things aren't, are not as important as understanding these power elements, okay? And the inductor is what we want to cover today and give you a better idea of how that works, okay? So I think we got this part done, right? But I want to go a little bit further now, okay? Uh, this I kind of showed the current. When the switch closes, the current charges up in the inductor, so the, so the current going to the transistor kind of looks like this, right? You know increases kind of linearly where you you want it to so if everything's working right it'll it'll go up pretty much linear and then it drops off straight line and then waits until the next cycle and then charges up again and each time it's pumping energy into this inductor when that turns off then the diode conducts and it pops up and discharges it lets that inductor discharge that current that got charged with and in this case, I'm showing them going to zero, so I'm kind of showing that critical conduction mode, okay? Just to make it easy so we don't have a DC current. So this picture here shows these two currents together. So that's what the current looks like to the inductor. Gets charged up through the FET, through the transistor, and then discharged through the diode, which the diode could be another transistor. In higher current applications, yeah, we do we use a FET, and that's something to show you later, but that's just so there's less losses. Instead of having a 0.7 volt drop, you have something less, okay? So that's not really important. The important thing is the, you know, having this kind of functionality, okay, that we're charging, discharging. Now, imagine this. If you just drew a line trying to figure out where the DC current was, if you just cut this in half, you could take the tops off, flip them over, and drop them down inside this well, right? And so... The DC current is equal to half that value, okay? So let's say they're 
uh, peak currents are 2 amps. Well, then you'd have 1 amp DC current equivalent, okay? And in this case, I'm also showing like 50% duty cycle because the time on and the time off, and we're, talk, we're just talking about transistor when we talk about duty cycle, the time on versus the time off is the same. Uh, my picture might not look like that, but <laughs> you know, that's why I'm trying, that's why I'm attempting to show. The other important part of that is the current level, uh, charging and discharging, it, it starts off at the same peak level. Well, it ends up there with the charge cycle and, and starts there at the discharge cycle. So even though I kind of showed them, they look like different peak levels here. Uh, yeah, that's just because they weren't to scale. They really should look like this. So it charges up to some peak value, say 2 amps, and, it's, and then starts at 2 amps and discharges, okay? And so this would be what I call critical conduction. As soon as it discharged, another cycle occurred, okay? This is right on the boundary of discontinuous and continuous. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to kind of talk about, well, what if it's not this? What if it's more of the continuous mode, which might be the more favorable mode, okay? What if it's that? Well, okay, so let's say that the current charged up this 2 amps, and then before this came all the way down from 2 amps to 0 amps, let's say it came down to 1 amp, and then we got another cycle. So the load didn't quite use, you know, we didn't transfer all that energy yet, okay? So let's say that happened. Well, now the inductor, it's, it's bucking the change of current, you know, but if it's already running, if it's still one amp when this switch turns on again, it's not bucking that. It's a, hey, I'm, I'm happy conducting one amp. That's where I am right now. Oh, you want me to do more? Okay, so then it starts to ramp up again. So it's sitting at one amp and now it's ramping up. So now this black line right here, let's just say that's one amp. So now you're charging from one amp up to Let's say you still charge at 2 amps. So, all right, so now uh, the average of the ripple part is still 1 amp. You know, half of 2 amps is still 1. So you start off with 1 amp DC, and now you have another 1 amp on top. So now you've got 2 amps output, okay? But, and your ripple current is 1 amp, well, or 2 amps peak to peak. So there comes a point where you could say, well, I want to keep my ripple current really low. So I'm going to use a big inductor and I'm going to run my DC current. Let's say I have five amps. I'm going to run it at four and a half amps and only let, you know, one amp peak to peak uh, ripple current. That's what I want because less ripple, better, right? Well, not necessarily. Anyway, we'll talk more about this as time goes on, but there's a lot of debate on what the... Uh, well, I don't know if I want to say a lot of debate. There's just a lot of different ideas about what the optimal ripple current is. I mean, you'll find anything probably between 20% and 40%. There's a guy that I really like. He, he advertises 40%. He thinks that 40% is the optimal level. One of the things to think about is the size of your capacitor, the size of your inductors. And, and we'll get into all that so you kind of see what the trade-offs are. But he feels like 40% gives you the optimal size of trade-offs for all these things. So what that would mean, like let's say you have 10 amps output. Then you would have 40% ripple current. So you'd have, uh, it would be going up to 12 amps and down to 8 amps. And it would average out at 10 amps. Okay, so here's another way to look at this. Uh, there might be cases where you can sit there and you know that your load is pretty consistent. If, you, if that's the case, then great. You can design an optimal, you know, optimally designed power supply. You can do all the things you need to do to get the right size of components and get the most efficiency. A lot of designs... Most designs, I think, uh, are not like that. The load is all over the place. Like, let's say your load is an audio amplifier. Well, there's a good example. Sometimes your load's gonna be very, very small, and other times 
someone's going to be playing it maxed out. So it's going to be high. And then even best case scenario, the load is changing all over the place, right? The average load might be, say, one or two amps output. But that average load's kind of bouncing all over. So if you're running motors or fans, uh, you could be sitting there, fans not doing anything. Or all of a sudden it ramps up and it's full speed. And then it sits there. So it could be two levels. A minimum, basically zero amps, and then a max. So when you're at zero amps, if your load's not asking for anything, you're going to be kind of discontinuous, right? Now there's some, con back to the control chip, there's some ways that they've, some tricks that they've tried to come up with. But let's just talk about, uh, you know, our average, we're, we're trying to, you know, there's a startup current thing, there's maybe a, uh, a transient load condition, there's all these other things to think about. But let's just say, hey, you know, when this thing's just operating uh, nominally, just running, you know, what's the, how should we size this thing? All right, guys, so let's say uh, that we're operating continuous current. How do we get there? Um, I redrew that two amp peak to peak ripple current, okay? The blue line represents kind of charging from four amps to six amps. And then the red, the diode taking over, discharging from six down to four. Well, let's just say that we're in this mode of operation right now. We charged up to this mode, but once we get here, let's see how that works. Now, the inductor doesn't like to change current instantly, right? So, the the current right here is at 4 amps when the diode stops conducting and then the transistor turns back on. Well, it's already running at 4 amps, so the inductor is happy with 4 amps. It's like, hey, I'm past 4 amps, I want to keep doing that. But, okay, I'll charge up again. So, whether it's doing it at 0 or at 4 you can get the same ripple with the same parts and everything. The way it gets from zero to this is the turn on. When you turn this on, there's some it ramps up, okay? And we'll we'll show that kind of stuff later. But once it ramps up, you know you got this ripple current like this, okay? And and it's just operating normally. Well so let's say your load goes from five amps to one amp. Well, that's great because a two amp peak to peak gets you right to that point where you're critically conductive, you know, conducting like in the last picture, like this guy right here. Okay, you're just going from two amps up down to zero, one amp average. So, one amp average, or this case, five amps average. So, if you had this scenario, then that'd be great. So, you could go from a one amp to five amp load with an inductor that would give you a two amp um, peak to peak ripple current. So in this case, you don't really have that option of choosing 30 or 40%. You would choose the option based on your minimum load. You'd say, well, okay, I'll allow myself to go critically conductive, like right to that point where it's gonna go discontinuous. So I'll make this my minimum load, my one amp, and then my five amp load, I'm just gonna have five amps, but I have two amps peak to peak ripple. Well, that two amps, actually in this case, it's interesting, it actually represents a 40% peak to peak ripple. So, just by dumb luck of me drawing it out here, it ended up 40%. But that would be, in some people's view, the ideal case, okay? So your capacitor's charging up, discharging this current, and your input is providing that, okay? Now, how do we design that inductor to do that? Let's look at that, okay? That's really where we wanna see with this video, okay? Let's get there. All right, guys, back to the board. Got formula here, very important formula. Got an example here, 12 volts in, six volts out. So it's half the voltage. So the duty cycle is gonna be 50%, which kind of follows what we've been showing here. There's two important cases. There's this really important formula here that is almost like Ohm's Law. We just use it a lot in power electronics. Voltage is equal to the inductance times the change of current in the inductor divided by that time that that current's changing, okay? So let's say the current's going from zero to two amps. How much time did that take? Well, you take that 
2 amps divided by that time multiplied by the inductance and you get how much voltage the difference of voltage across that inductor. Well on the discharge the currents can be the same times can be the same because duty cycle is 50 percent so it's the same for either side of the current so the voltage and you're going to have one inductance value it's not going to change so the voltage is going to be the same across it so the time on you're going to have 12 volts here 6 volts here so you get 12 volts and 6 volts you get 6 volts across the inductor during the time off this is essentially zero the diode is going to be it's going to be a diode drop otherwise this can be pulled down pretty close to zero if it's a synchronous fence it's going to be even closer but it's pretty close to zero on this output side we have six volts so yeah your duty cycle you know ideal situation 50 percent 12 volts in 12 or six volts out everything kind of works out the same you're gonna have six volts on the inductor during charge and discharge so the time's going to be the same right okay let's just say a case now where we're going to drop this to 3.3 volts so we're going to drop this to even lower Okay, well, if it's 12 minus 3.3, well then this voltage here goes up. So now you have more voltage across the inductance. So if this goes up, but the current, the peak currents are still going to be the same. You're still going to charge up the same amount as you're going to discharge. So if the voltage goes up across the inductor, the inductance didn't change, the current didn't change, so the time has to change. So your duty cycle, the time on, is going to get smaller. So if this goes higher, then this is going to go smaller to maintain this equation so it's still equal. Then this is 3.3, so now this is going to be smaller. So this is smaller. This is still the same inductor. The current is still 2 amps, so that means this has to get bigger to make that smaller. So your time discharging is going to be longer so that's how this kind of works you know it's duty cycle controlled it's how much time are you transferring that current and that tells you how much voltage since these two things are going to stay the same this guy and this guy are going to change so your time is going to maintain your voltage okay so in the other case let's say this is 9 volts now it's bigger so 12 minus 9 is 3 volts so this is smaller, so that means that's got to get bigger. Now you got to have the switch on even longer to get 9 volts out. But then on the off time, it's only going to be, it's going to be 9 volts now. So now this is bigger, so this has to get smaller. So your discharge time is going to be less. You see how that works? This, this principle is very important. Okay, let's solve for the inductor, okay? Let's see what that inductor size actually is. All right, I hope you can see that green. Uh, I use green just to do the math for the time. So we're gonna just say 100 kilohertz, make it easy. So frequency is equal to 100 kilohertz. Time is equal to one order frequency is 10 microseconds per cycle, okay? Well, duty cycle, DC, is equal to 50%. We're saying it's 50% on off, right? So then the time on is equal to time off and it's half of 50% of 10 microseconds, so it's 5 microseconds. So I've rearranged this formula over here, right? I took uh, L and put it by itself, so I had to cross multiply these two things across, so they essentially just flip upside down from what they were here. So now we get uh, voltage times change of time divided by change of current. Change of time is 5 microseconds takes five microseconds to charge up or five microseconds to discharge and it's going up two amps either way and it's changing six volts because it's 50 percent it's a kind of easy example i showed so in this case six volts divided by two is three three times five is 15 microhenries so it's 15 microhenries so 15 microhenry inductor would give you this uh example Okay, so this is just our first example in this. Just kind of get started, kind of walk you through how all this stuff works. Let me know if you think that was helpful. And if you like that, we're going to show an example. I have a, a board here. We're going to use 
we're going to look at on the scope and I think I might even use this new Pico scope. Anyway, we'll look at the uh, the example in the next video and we'll see how it works. Okay, we'll kind of reverse engineer it. All right, but hopefully this makes sense and I'm going to show you some examples of this. We're going to do enough of this stuff that if it does make sense now, hopefully it will. <laughs> but yeah, go back and look at the other two videos if you haven't seen them. This is video number three in the series. Uh, thanks for my patrons for all your support and everything. I really appreciate it. And you become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. Always like to throw that out there. And uh, appreciate all you guys watching the videos and commenting. It's really helpful to the channel. It also helps give a thumbs up. It helps the YouTube analytics and the channel and all that kind of stuff. So, all right, guys. Hope you liked it. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.